And how uh, how does your process change from project to project? Because you you're doing a little bit of everything. I, I imagine it's, it's it's pretty much strictly Malamander at the moment, um, and, and and in that world. Um, but between writing middle grade picture books, comics, do you keep yes. a similar routine for all of those? How how does your process change? Uh, I um. I mean, obviously, you have to be good at self-motivation, <laughs> and I find that quite difficult. But I find it somehow it's easier to sit down and draw than to sit down and start writing. I find myself far more of a procrastinator when it comes to writing. So I do have to force myself a bit more. Um, and there's another big change that is quite significant, actually. I, I, yeah, I love podcasts. I love audio content. I love listening to audiobooks and when I'm drawing, I have a continuous stream of radio or podcast or um, audiobook or whatever it may be, audio content of all kinds of music. But when I'm writing, I have to have complete silence. And so uh, if I switch between a, a mostly writing project to a mostly drawing project, it seems to have a knock-on effect for the rest of my life. So, for example, if, um, if I go the other way and I've got used to listening to, to a series of um, podcasts and, and um, audiobooks, um, during a drawing project, when I switch to writing and I'm writing all day, I miss all those things. And so when I'm walking the dog, I've got the headphones in and I'm catching up, scrambling to catch up. Um, so there are little things like that. It's quite different. Um, and also I need more room. I'm drawing. I need uh, I need uh, I need to get the drawing board out. But my 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 desk comes up. It folds up. becomes a, a light box. And I have um, papers everywhere. It takes up a lot more room. And then when I'm writing, I'm just here at the, the screen or I'm, I take my laptop to um, the cafe or something. So um, there are all these kind of um, very basic differences that affect the way I work. Um, but a lot of it is pretty seats of the pants stuff. I, I, I'm i a real pantster when it comes to uh, rather than a plotter. Um, I do wish I could plan a bit more, but uh, it's quite tricky. I don't know about you. How are you? How are, you? are you a planner or a Oh, everybody's somewhere on the spectrum. I'm a little bit closer to plotter than pantser because I like to play like I'm doing chess where I usually know at least a couple of moves ahead. And I, I almost always know, give or take, what ending I'm shooting for. Then I let the characters decide whether or not they can talk me out of it, which occasionally they do. <laughs> there, there were a couple that I planned to kill that <laughs> okay. talked me out of it. Okay, uh, wow. And then there were a few that I, I was sure would make it and that he didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's obviously what I'm uh, writing for older readers. Yeah. Uh, so I like to have what I call a grocery list. Like if I'm going to the store, I, I wouldn't go so far as to like draw myself a map of here's the aisle that you're going to go to and you're going to get the items in this order. But I'd still have more or less a list of things I want to pick up while I'm there. And maybe a couple of other I mean, while I'm out, I'm like, well, I'm this close to this such and such a store. And I find that kind of a similar process to writing, if that makes sense. Yeah. To, yeah. Okay, well, I'm here in the plot, but while I'm here, wouldn't it be fun to do this and this? Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think you need to have the bare bones, don't you? But you also need the, the, the capacity to change direction or bring something surprising in or, or allow yourself to make a change. So I think it's good to be a bit of both. I just think I need to get the balance a bit more over to where you seem to be, where a bit more planned. <laughs> oh, and that we've already agreed that stories are found objects, so theoretically, uh, true. <laughs> you can do it either way, and you'll you'll come to it, right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but I do find if I give in to that too much, I, I never write like a first line of anything without some idea where I'm headed. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't have to know the whole thing. And in fact, uh, the one time I did sit down and I wrote out a, a twenty-page outline with detailed. Uh, steps. I never wrote that novel. I already okay. had the outline. I knew what was going to happen. Mm. Put that away. Next project. Um, right. So I like to wow. have the, the joy of discovery a little bit as I'm going. But just yeah. With yeah. some planning involved. Mm. Yeah. No, you're right. The other thing I'm a big fan of is if I can get uh, just small, smaller chunks or maybe a first half to my writing group um, ahead of time because I know they're going to tear me apart anyway. <laughs> and if they tear me apart in the middle of the story, as opposed to after I've already written the thing, after I've already written the thing, I fall into despair. I'm like, no, I did it. It's, it's beautiful. Why would you tear it up so badly? But if you tell me in the middle where there's still a chance for me to reconfigure some things and, and get it where I want it still by the end, mm -hmm. I just find that that's a more pleasant process. Yes, yeah, that, that, that sounds right. Pleasant can ever be a word used to describe to sit down and hear your friends talk about 
your <laughs> fictional shortcomings. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> and do you keep uh, specific hours? What does your writing day look like? Um, I um, I prefer to work. I think my ideal time to work would be early afternoon through into the evening. But since I became a father, I haven't been able to, to do that. So with the school day and everything, I'm, I'm forced to work mornings. So I do have to um, get children to school, get the dog walked, <laughs> and then try to be at least sitting at my desk by about 10 a.m., um, and try and work from there and then if i can possibly work beyond 3 p.m when the children will be imminently arriving home then uh, I, I will but usually i have to stop around then so um the, my working day is squashed into this sort of uh six hour period in the middle but i think with writing it's a mistake to try and work too much for too long it's good to have a quite a short period where you're quite intense uh, about, about it and then um, not try and write too much because in the past I've, I've worked all day and written 7,000 words and thought myself I've been really clever and then got up the next day back to my desk to read those 7,000 words and they're pretty awful whereas if I'd written <laughs> 2,000 maybe I'd have I'd have got something better and they needed a bit less uh, um, editing so uh, I try not to work if I'm writing anyway if I'm drawing I have to work long hours I will but from writing I try to make it um relatively short period that I am actually writing um unless you're at that stage and I'm sure you know this where you just you just can't stop because you've you've got to get the next bit you've got to get the next bit that wonderful moment they call flow I think where you just you have to be there and uh, everyone wants to get there but um that's quite rare <laughs> Those wonderful moments where it seems to be almost writing itself as the, the top experience of being a writer, I think, but uh, few and far between. And then I turned to myself and I'm like, what the heck was the wrong with the rest of your week? Why wasn't it all like this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I when I have a great day and I'm starting to plan out, when is this actually going to be done? And I said, well, if every day is just like today, then I got next week. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Then the next day is never as good. <laughs> yeah. Mm. You know, a lot, of, a lot of up and down, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, do you have, I'm, I'm fascinated by author rituals. Do you have little things that you do? Like, uh, I, I call it the passing of a, a gold watch, like a hypnotist, where you're, you're self-hypnotizing, getting yourself into the story world. Do you have little things that you have to do before you start writing? Um, not really, but when um, when it's, I have a scarf that I like to wear if if it's not hot. So at the moment I haven't been wearing it for a while because it's the summer, but um, my grandmother knitted me, I think I mentioned she's a librarian. She knitted me a Doctor Who style scarf when I was about 17, I think. This is Tom Baker Doctor Who, so you know, going back a bit. And I've still got it. And um, I like to wear it when I'm writing. I like to put it around, especially if I'm not sure what I'm doing. And I, I don't actively think of my grandmother every time I wear it, I don't think, but I I just find it helps me to to get into the writing mood because I've become used to doing it, I suppose. But uh, um, I don't have to have it to write, but I quite like having it. So that, that becomes, especially in the winter, that becomes quite a, a regular um, feature of my writing day because it's very long, so I can wrap it around my head. So I, sometimes I'm barely looking out. <laughs> but, um, I'm not sure if that counts, but... Uh, <laughs> No, absolutely. I've actually got uh, same grand grandmother who who saw the flying saucer. Um, uh, bought me an ET blanket when I was uh, a kid. There was this big auction uh, that we went to, and everyone was you know it was a state auction. And I stood by this ET blanket for I think three or four hours. Uh, and my parents' uh, money was a little bit tight, so they said, "No, just leave it. You have ET things at home." Uh, but my grandmother, after I left, went and, and got it for me. Uh, and oh, so I, I still have it, and I keep it in my reading chair. So when I'm reading, I like to I like to have it there. Okay, yeah, it's nice to have things like that. And I think um, writers are like sailors. I think they become very superstitious about things as well. And um, nice to have the, the the right pen and the right pencil and the the right conditions to sit down to write. Or maybe those are excuses that uh, you just can't get those things together. That's a good reason not to do any work that day. But uh... <laughs> it's probably more true than that. <laughs> My wife suggested that I've been writing on the same desk since I was sixteen, fifteen, mm -hmm. uh, and it's you know it's looking a little little old down. Uh, she pointed out, you know, there are furniture stores here. We, we could afford to get you a nicer desk. And I'm just scandalized. Like, no, how would I ever write <laughs> on a different desk? 
<laughs> you yeah, tried yeah, to, yeah. to ruin my entire writing career? Goodness. <laughs> yeah. I'm watching the clock go by, and I know I've got to wrap this up soon to go get uh, a very hungry child off a bus so he can That's wolf out everything in our, our kitchen. Um, so let me ask you this for all the questions that I haven't thought to, to ask you. If there was something that one thing, two things, a little bit of wisdom. If you could go back and tell yourself at the start of your career, um, other than hang on to that Harry Potter manuscript, because that's going to be worth <laughs> um, If there was something you could go back and, and tell a younger version of you that would have made your writing journey better, what would that thing be? I think I should have um, started earlier. And I think that I uh, would go back and tell myself to be brave and start because I, there was a long time I think when it occurred to me that I liked creating stories in my head and um, um, but I was a bit nervous about starting to try and write because I think I was worried I wouldn't be able to and I would, would be a big a big disappointment I think I should have been braver and just started earlier um, whether or not that's helpful to anybody else I don't know but that's what I should have told myself I think Oh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Writing takes courage. Uh, and spoiler, we're, we're all going to die anyway. So, yes. <laughs> so, well, so far, I'm still holding out hope for myself. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> but so far, that, that seems to be the trend. Uh, so you might yes, as well do yes. the thing that you, you want to do, right? Yeah, definitely. definitely. And then we'll have a very different conversation because at that point, we'll know whether or not they're a ghost, presumably. Right? Well, absolutely. <laughs> Come back about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll do an scary. afterlife podcast. <laughs> It'll yeah. be the sensation of the uh, of the afterlife. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas, where uh, can